Criminal accusations and filmmaking have a long and storied history. Most of the time, the cases involve disgruntled people suing each other after the fact, or the cinematic murders produced by Adam Sandler. But what about when crime is part of the creative process, when filmmakers transcend the rules of us mere mortals and pursue their art by doing just whatever the hell they want and dealing with the police later? He said, wait a minute. He said, maybe there's a way. I said, well, what, what would that be? He said, $40,000 and a one-way ticket to Jamaica. I'm Adam from WhatCulture.com, and here are 10 people who totally broke the law to make their movies. Number 10, Stanley Kubrick basically tortured Shelley Duvall. Ah! Stanley Kubrick knows how to get incredible career-defining performances out of his actors, whether the actors like it or not. For instance, he took poor Shelley Duvall to the brink of madness while shooting The Shining. Also, Shelley Duvall happened to be in Popeye that year. It was a bad year for Shelley Duvall. Kubrick forced the actress to endlessly reshoot her scenes, hounded her for her performance, and consciously created a negative set atmosphere where crew were encouraged to shun the actress and make her feel more vulnerable. Harassment is absolutely a crime, folks. Oh, come on. What do you mean, roll Two video? Seconds. We're killing ourselves out here. Though Duvall conceded it was an enriching experience and her performance speaks for itself, her body did not agree and she struggled with nervous exhaustion, illness, and hair loss. The windowsill on the back got cut. Major trimmer. Hunks of hair. Oh, look. Okay. Major trimmer. Hunks of hair. I don't sympathize with Shelly. Number 9, Danny Dyer actually took drugs for human traffic. Out of his nut, he was. If anyone who saw Justin Kerrigan's Generation MDMA tale of a typical lost weekend of Bender's clubbing and the naughty pilly druggy drugs will have noticed the authenticity of the experience. It's a nailed on portrait of youth escaping the monotony of their McJobs and lack of prospects through hedonism. Particularly authentic was the way actors sold their ecstasy highs in various club scenes, which makes sense considering at least one of them has retrospectively admitted to being off his face during filming. Danny Dyer, unlikely British film legend and soap star, got the job as Moth by candidly admitting that he loved taking drugs and then conceded in an interview years later that his drug taking and acting career had overlapped for human traffic. Number eight, Michael Curtis murdered actors for Noah's Ark. Before making the beloved classic Casablanca, Michael Curtis was already making a name for himself as a great filmmaker. Not only was he the studio's best friend by delivering on time and under budget, he was also incredibly he achieved these things by apparently ignoring the value of human life. For Noah's Ark's climactic flood scene, Curtis had grand ideas and wanted to shoot as authentically as possible, pelting his extras with as much water as he could get his hands on, ignoring calls to use miniatures rather than real-life humans and animals, and thus avoiding things as inconvenient as, you know, death. Curtis ignored warnings only for the massive scene to lead to three extras dying, another losing a limb, and almost a dozen suffering broken bones and other injuries. Thanks to the lack of a union at the time, and apparently any police who actually cared, Curtis escaped escaped any sort of blame. Number seven, Melvin Van Peeble exploits his son. Seminal black exploitation film Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song, which basically invented the genre, almost didn't happen thanks to financial issues. Partly because of the lack of money, Van Peebles made a true exploitation film by exploiting those working for him and using questionable quality extras, which also led to him contracting gonorrhea from an extra in a clearly all too realistic sex scene. He also used child labor, putting his son Mario on screen, which would have been fine if he hadn't got him to shoot a horribly realistic sex scene with a significantly older woman, and if Mary hadn't been very much underage at the time. Incredibly, Child Protection Services didn't turn up to take him away. Number six, real drug use in Easy Rider. Long before Danny Dyer was popping pills against the right frame of mind for human traffic, marijuana was playing a massive part of the production of Easy Rider, not least on director Dennis Hopper, who struggled badly with drug-induced paranoia to the extent that his tirades were secretly recorded and sent to the studio by crew to explain why they kept having to quit. Clearly, having learned nothing from the dark side of his own drug experiences, Hopper got his actors, and himself, high on weed. The scene in which the three leads smoke marijuana wasn't fake, though Peter Fonda swears blind nobody actually took LSD. And Hopper got Jack Nicholson so high for his iconic UFO speech that it got in the way of filming. But since most of the crew ended up being hippies picked up at communes across the country who are more often than not stoned themselves, nobody seemed to mind. Number five, surprise, surprise, the Rolling Stones took drugs. Not to be outdone by the drug-induced excesses of Easy Rider, the Rolling Stones made their own movie, Cocksucker Blues, which was designed to be a warts and all backstage documentary, which unraveled spectacular. Thanks to a bafflingly liberal creative process which allowed anyone who fancied a blast on the camera to film, some of the shots captured go well beyond candid. So outrageous was the material that the Stones sued for their portrayal, despite the fact that they definitely snorted the drugs they were shown snorting, and definitely embarked on the sexual misadventures that they were misadventuring. Mis 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 
I guess. The film was successfully suppressed by the Stones, who clearly didn't like the image in the mirror, though it can be shown once a year as long as the director is in situ. Number four, Cannibal Holocaust murdered a spider. Cannibal Holocaust's perverse greatness is very much a matter of opinion, but its importance is assured. So convincing was the film's outrageous content that people genuinely thought it was an actual snuff film. And to be honest, it was, because while no humans died for the movie, the director genuinely did command the savage murder of several animals, including beheading a monkey, shotgunning a pig, hacking a turtle to death, and killing a spider with a machete. Clearly those crimes against the animal kingdom would be severely punished today, and it was for animal cruelty and an added crime of obscenity that the director, the producers, and United Artists were given a four-month suspended sentence. Number three, Jafar Panahi smuggled anti-governmental propaganda out of Iran in a cake. Righto. Sadly, when laws are set by tyrannical leaders with no idea of what progress means, they're still classed as laws as long as the lawmaker stays in power. So the drastic Iranian censorship laws that sought to silence documentary filmmaker Jafar Panahi and sent him to prison for six years for propaganda against the regime were still legally binding, strictly speaking. Panahi then documented his life, despite being banned, in order to save at least some of his artistic visions. He read segments of a planned film and reflected on what his life had become, offering a glimpse into the fear he lived in constantly thanks to the political activism. Not content with flouting his filmmaking ban, the director also risked the ire of his nation's government by smuggling the film from Iran to Cannes on a data stick hidden inside a birthday cake. Number two, John Landis and the Shoot of Death. Very much one of the worst things to happen to a movie set in the history of cinema, and horrific accident during the filming of Twilight Zone. The movie resulted in the deaths of three actors, two of them children, two of them hired illegally. There is so much bad happening here. During the filming of a war scene, health and safety protocols were flouted when a helicopter was ordered to fly too close to an explosion, the blast brought the chopper down on top of three actors, Victor Moreau and two Vietnamese children, all of whom were killed. The children had been paid under the table to circumvent the laws that prevented child actors from being used at night and for dangerous scenes involving explosions. Director John Landis and numerous other crew members were tried on charges of manslaughter and the studio settled several millions of dollars worth of civil lawsuits. And number one, when Kim Jong-il wants a movie, Kim Jong-il gets a movie. Leave it to North Korea. The country that infamously decided that the interview was basically grounds for war once broke all sorts of laws to pander to the crazy desires of Kim Jong-il, a movie buff who outlawed international movies and wanted his industry to be the best. In order to make that a reality, the supreme leader employed, oh no wait, I'm sorry, forcibly kidnapped his favorite South Korean actor and director couple and brought them to North Korea where they were imprisoned. He then told the married couple they would never see each other again if they didn't make films for his government. The result of this incredible flaunting of international human rights laws was seven films, the most famous of which being a crappy monster flick called Paul Gasari, impregnated with way with propaganda and an anti-capitalist message, obviously, or as everyone in North Korea calls it, the best film ever made. And that's our list. Did we miss any out? Tell us about it in the comments. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter here. I'm Adam from whatculture.com and I'll see you soon.